What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Julian Farah. Thank you very much for tuning in. Today, we're back with another lens review. I don't do that many gear reviews, but every now and then, I take the time to give my impressions. So anybody looking for an ultra-wide angle who's using the Canon M system, so the little APS-C Canon lenses, will be very happy to know that I've been using one of their little ultra-wides for the last, uh, I would say, three and a half years. So I'm here today, here today to give you my impressions of that lens. So without further ado, let's get into the review of the Canon EFM 1122 STM IS lens for the Canon M mount system. So guys, I've been using this lens for the last uh, four years, I would say, since 2016 when I received the EFM 1122. And Canon wasn't actually late to the game. They're always very late to the game with everything that they do. That's, that's no, obviously that's no secret. Just look at the release of the Canon R5 and R6. They were about two years late. That's another story. But the Canon EFM uh, 1122 ultra wide lens uh, comes in a nice cheap box as usual. I figured I would do an unboxing for everybody who's never seen this lens before. So I'll do it quickly. I won't take too much of your time because I've already unboxed the lens, but I figured I would make it easier for people that want to, you know, purchase the lens maybe. So it comes with some manuals, some warranty cards, as usual, some cheap polymer plastic. Here is the lens wrapped up in the, uh, whatever this is, synthetic material. And we have our 1122. Once again, Canon, no lens cap, bravo. Bravo, no lens cap, way to save money. Now, like I said, guys, I know I'm very late to this review. Uh, this lens has been out actually since uh, 2015 in North America and since 2013 in Asia. But I figured, uh, you know, I have four years experience using the lens and I believe my feedback can help a prospective buyer looking or interested in, you know, getting an ultra wide angle lens for the Canon M system. So the lens uh, is valued at 539 Canadian dollars plus tax. Uh, quite a good value for this lens considering um, the only other lens uh, in the segment that's cheaper is one of Canon's own lens, the 1018 STM lens for the Canon EFS mount. So it's not the cheapest lens, but it's significant, definitely not the most expensive lens either. Um, once again, I, I reiterate the fact that there's no lens hood is quite disappointing on Canon's part. I mean, it's not a cheap lens by any means. $540, you know, is not pocket change. Anyway, uh, it comes with the front cap. It comes with the rear cap and the lens mount is made actually of metal uh, versus the cheap kit lens that comes with the M6 or M5, the 1545 that has a plastic mount. Uh, the lens is made in Taiwan, uh, as you can see. So it's still pretty good. Um, there we go, we'll just close that up right away. So one thing to note about this lens, in order to use it, it needs to be unlocked. Uh, and I never really understood the, re the, you know, the reasoning behind that or why we needed to do that. But as you can see on the side of this lens, there's a little switch and it impairs the lens from actually turning. You actually have to click it and then turn to unlock the lens. After you do that in your camera, the lens will actually activate. If you don't unlock it, it won't activate and you're not gonna be able to use the lens. I never understood what the purpose of this was, but I can only assume that Canon designed it like this to be very portable and very light. Because even if the lens does pop out, it actually focuses internally. So what you see is not the actual focus and the actual zoom range. Uh, it focuses internally. So I'm not sure what this is for. Anyhow, I'm sure it's made for transport. So 1122 in 35 millimeter terms basically means 18 millimeters to 35 millimeter range. It's a variable aperture lens, uh, meaning it goes from f4 all the way to f5.6 at the extremity. Uh, we're at, when we're at 11 millimeters at the widest, at widest part of the lens, we're at actually f4. When we move into 12 millimeters, we get down to 4.5 when we're at f5. Uh, we're at 15 millimeters, and then when we get to 22 millimeters, we're actually at f5.6. So it is a variable aperture lens, meaning you lose light progressively as you zoom through the range from 11 to 22. Uh, it's mostly made of anodized aluminum and some polycarbonate plastic. So actually, it might look small, but it's actually quite dense. It's a solid feeling lens, even if it only weighs 220 grams. 
uh, which is very, very light. It's still very solid. Compared to the kit lens that comes with the camera, the 15 to 45 feels very, very flaky and cheap in comparison. You can hear that it's really flimsy. It's very flimsy plastic. You don't get any of that uh, with the EFM 1122. It's actually a much more solid lens. It actually feels dense in hand. And although obviously, you know, the, you know it's not fully made of metal, it's uh, anodized aluminum and polycarbonate. I believe, you know, it could take a little bit of abuse. I wouldn't climb Mount Everest with it, but you know, as usual, Canon products are built very, very solidly and they're very, you know, high quality lenses. They know how to build glass. So uh, obviously being a variable aperture lens, it's a lens mostly made for daytime shooting. Uh, it's not gonna be able to stop any action in low light because F4 is simply not fast enough. Uh, you want a lens like that, then obviously you wanna pick up an EFM 32, the 1.4 lens that I reviewed a few months back. Um, speaking of low light shooting, it does have three stops of image stabilization built in, uh, which can be clicked on and off in the camera. It cannot be turned on and off by the lens, unfortunately. There's no switches on the actual lens. In real world testing, as you can see by the shots on screen, I noticed that I was getting about a third of a stop less than the three stops that Canon mentioned. So still quite good. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a wide angle lens. Most of the time in a wide angle lens, uh, as long as you're within shooting the shutter speed, you're not gonna get any vibration. So if, if I'm shooting at 11 millimeters, I should be around 1 20th of a second and I'll be able to get pretty good handheld footage, even without the stabilization activated and that means. Um, that brings us to the next topic. Obviously, this lens is not weather sealed, and obviously that's what that's also a drag. None of the Canon lenses for the M system are weather sealed. They're designed to be portable and within you know reasonable price bracket. Obviously, coming in at $529, you can't expect weather sealing on a lens of this nature. The competition is mostly more expensive. If I look at Fujinon lenses from the Fuji system, you're looking roughly a thousand dollars for their 1024. Obviously, it got you know it does go a bit wider. Uh, and it's an f4 constant aperture obviously you're paying for that as well as the weather resistance same goes for the sony lens on there i believe it's their um their aps-c mount their 1020 or 1018 i believe it is it's around eight or nine hundred dollars and once again it is a bit wider and it does have an, a constant f4 aperture but you know it's coming in at almost double the cost so you have to weigh out is that really worth it at the end of the day because as you're going to see there's really no image quality difference uh, between those lenses the image quality is actually superb on this lens, which we'll get to that a little bit later. And it has a 55 millimeter filter. So it actually shares that with its bigger brother, not bigger brother, a lens called the 18150, also made for the EFM system. So if you have a lens for 55 millimeters, you're able to share uh, these two lens, obviously lens dimensions, uh, filter dimensions. Now 55 isn't a very popular filter size, but you know, being small, filters aren't very expensive and you can also use step-up rings to get you to a more standard filter size such as 67 or 72. Speaking a little bit about the optical design, uh, we have a uh, seven diaphragm blade lens, so that gives 14 point sun stars. We also have 12 elements in nine groups, uh, so a very nice construction, obviously capable of giving fantastic image quality. Another notely worthy feature of this lens is the focusing distance. This lens focuses down to about 0.15 meters, giving a maximum magnification of 0.30. That is significantly higher uh, than any of the lenses in this segment. And, it, and although it's not a macro lens, you can get very, very close. And as I'm showing in the images on screen, you can see how close you're able to get uh, with that close focusing distance. And at 22 millimeters, even with an f5.6 aperture, you can still get some very nicely out of focus backgrounds with this lens. So that's one noteworthy, one noteworthy feature that I'm quite impressed with. That's actually a very close focusing lens. One might think because you already have the 15 to 45 uh, kit lens that comes with the camera or most of the kit lenses, that 11 millimeters is not much of a significant difference. Well, I'm here to tell you that there's a massive difference in field of view between 11 millimeters and 15 on an APS-C sensor. And as you can see on screen here, I've took some, some screenshots to show you guys the difference. As you can see over here on screen, this is a 15 millimeter shot. Now, let me show you the 11 millimeter shot. So that's the 11 millimeter shot. So that's a massive difference. If I look at the 15 and the 11, 15 millimeters and 11, that's a massive difference. In the real world of testing, and let's say in terms of a landscape, that would be the difference almost between three quarters of a kilometer back to get the same footage. And the difference in focal length that four millimeters makes is actually quite dramatic. Another noteworthy feature would be the fact that it has three stops of image stabilization. 
Uh, it's built into the lens. It can only be activated via the main menu in the camera because there's no switches on the actual lens. So you can't turn it off such as uh, on a Canon 7200 where you have a little clicker. You have to actually physically go into your, into your M5 or your M6 and turn it on or off. In my experience, um, it gave me about a third of a stop less than what the manufacturer uh, specified. That's okay, I've had successful shots even down to 0.5 seconds. Getting into autofocus now, um, I've had no trouble with the autofocus on this lens. It uses an STM motor, which is known as the Canon stepping motor uh, for both photo and for video. Uh, very quiet focusing motors. Uh, I wasn't able to hear any sounds even while recording video. Nonetheless, the lens had no problem focusing in low light scenarios as you can see on the screen. In daylight, it had no problems focusing photo or video both on the M5 and on the M6 Mark II with the M6 Mark II being even quick, quicker to focus than the M5. So all in all, it's a very quick focusing lens. I've had no problem with it. I don't like the fact that it's a focus by wire, meaning you cannot override to manual focus physically on the lens. You do need to click a button either on the back of your camera, such as the manual focus button to be able to get it into manual focus. And then when you do turn your focusing ring a full 360, it's controlled electronically. It's not a physical focusing. So I don't like that. It's known as focus by wire, but that's the way it's built. The only time I had a little bit of trouble focusing, and I think that's pretty much uh, a normal standard in all cameras and all lenses, when we were talking about low contrast images, so when I'm trying to focus on an all white background or an all black background with only a little bit of contrasting elements, the lens did tend to hunt just a little bit. Uh, but I think that, like I said, I think that's normal. I mean, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, $800, $900 cameras, even on a full frame DSLR, such as a 1DX Mark III, low contrast is low contrast, the camera would not be able to focus properly. All in all, I'm gonna say that I think uh, it's a reasonably fast focusing lens. You can also buy extension tubes to get your minimum focusing difference, even a uh, minimum, sorry, minimum focusing distance, even closer uh, than 0.15 meters. Canon doesn't make any, but you can find some from third party. I think Young now actually makes some, but I'm not entirely sure. Take a look on the website for yourself. Getting into vignetting, distortion, and chromatic aberrations. We'll start off with vignetting. Let's take a look on the screen and go through our examinations. Obviously, when it comes to vignetting, the lens does vignette. I mean, every wide angle lens uh, has a certain amount of vignetting. It's just an inherent nature. At F4, you're gonna see by the screen, there is a little bit amount of vignetting, nothing too dramatic over here, as you can tell by the corners. We get open up to F5.6, the, the vignetting is a little bit better. Let's go back to F4, you can see on the sides, F5.6. Let's jump now to F8, where the vignetting is pretty much all gone. We are always at 11 millimeters. And then by F11 and 11 millimeters, there's pretty much no vignetting at all. Uh, let's go back to F4 and see the difference. F4 to F5.6. So you can see there's definitely a difference at F4, the lens does vignette, but I wouldn't call it anything uh, image destruction. You can fix that. There are lens profiles available in Lightroom to fix that with a small penalty of added noise because you'd be brightening up the extremities of the corners. I consider vignette to be a creative element in all of my images. I actually leave the vignette there. It actually doesn't bother me at all. So I'm actually okay with it. If it does, know that you can correct it. It's not a big deal. And this, this only usually happens in between 11 and 50 millimeters. By 18 millimeters and up, even wide open, there really isn't that much vignetting, even noticeable in real world terms. So that's not a big deal. Speaking about distortion now. Most zoom lenses do suffer from barrel distortion at the wide end and they move into pincushion distortion into the longer end. Barrel distortion is when actual lines that are supposed to be straight start to concave outwards and pincushion distortion is the opposite, they concave inwards. This lens at 11 millimeter, as you're gonna see on the screen right now, does have some significant barrel distortion. Um, let me take a look right here and you can see it right over here. You can see how the lines over here uh, do concave outwards. Let me go ahead and annotate that for you. It might be a bit easier. So if I draw over here and go to the drawing and you can see right here. So you can see right over here, this area, the lines aren't entirely straight. So this happens at 11 millimeters and it clears up at around 16 millimeters. When you get to 22 millimeters, I'm happy to say there is no pin cushion distortion. It doesn't suffer from that. But due to the fact that there's heavy barrel distortion on this lens, it would probably be very hard for me to recommend this um, 
to do any serious architecture work. I would probably invest in a lens that has a little bit less barrel distortion than this. As much as it's correctable, it just adds more work to, your, you know, to, the, to, the, to the job at hand. So I'd recommend getting a tilt shift lens for any serious architectural work. Uh, let me show you at 22 millimeters. So this is now 22 millimeters. Um, and at 22 millimeters, uh, you can see that there is no more barrel distortion. Let's go back to 11. 11 millimeters, you can see it over here. The lines, they're all barrelly distorted. You can see they're pulling outwards. And at 22, it's pretty much gone. Back to 11 and back to 22. So it does suffer from some, in my opinion, some significant barrel distortion, but no pincushion distortion. Uh, I also have uh, created a, a very good lens by Lawa. It's a Chinese manufacturer who's, who's actually been making some Z at zero D lens, which is called zero distortion. And they're almost 99% distortion free. It's actually quite amazing. Those are the lenses that I would recommend. They're manual focusing lenses and about a quarter of the cost of any, uh, of any of the actual OEM manufacturers. So I think that's fantastic. Getting into chromatic aberration. I didn't unfortunately have any testing tools to test the lateral chromatic aberration. Uh, I, I need a, sort of like a drawing, a black and white drawing. All I can tell you is based on other reviews that I've seen, it does suffer from a tad bit of lateral chromatic aberration, but it's really nothing major and it disappears after 5.6. However, another amazing thing about this lens, the longitudinal aberration, we call it longitudinal chromatic aberration, known as purple or green fringing seen in bright scenes that you can see. This lens literally has none. Let's take a look on the screen. If we look at the images on screen right now, okay, I actually tried to, <laughs> okay, here we are at f5.6. Uh, I tried to actually get some, some, some chromatic aberration to try and make it mimic any, but you can see even zoomed in, the lens just doesn't have any chromatic aberrations. There is no fringing anywhere. This is at 11 millimeters f5.6. There's no purple fringing anywhere on this lens. Uh, that's actually astonishing when you think about it because it's an ultra wide angle lens and they usually suffer from some form of longitudinal chromatic aberration. Here at 7.1, same story. We can zoom in and see. We're now at 7.1, 11 millimeter. There is no fringing. There is no chromatic aberration at all. Any longitudinal dimension at all. Let's head out now to F11 uh, at 11 millimeters. Let's zoom in. And here we are at F11. Once again, nothing, no fringing to speak about. And we're literally having the sun coming in directly on this shiny glass vase. So this would be the optimal time that you would actually see any form of aberrations on the lens. And it has none. That's actually astounding considering, especially because it's an ultra wide angle lens. So uh, I was literally trying to find some at 11, at 15 millimeters, at 22, I couldn't find any. Uh, longitudinal chromatic aberration. That's amazing uh, for landscape work, uh, especially if you're going to be wide open. Most of the time we're not shooting landscape work wide open. We're more around the F8 to F11 region, but either way, sometimes we do need to hand hold some shots because the light dips. Happy to say that even when the sun is shining, there is none to speak of. Speaking about flaring, uh, the lens controls flares quite well. Um, I took most of the shots without the uh, lens hood attached because the lens hood obviously would help the lens flare and it would actually control some of the flaring. So I decided to take these shots that I'm showing you now on screen without any lens flaring. And you're gonna see it handles flaring in video quite well. I wouldn't say that it's perfect. Uh, there is still some green blotchiness. I don't think that it's a problem when doing video. I do however believe that in photo this could cause an issue. Uh, if you take a look at this picture facing directly into the sun, you'll see that there's a little bit of a green blotch, purple blotch. Those can be a bit difficult to remove in post-processing. So the lens isn't entirely as flare resistant as say the EFM 32, which was incredible in that regard. Uh, but for video, I don't think it's a problem. Uh, with the hood on, obviously these values would be a bit better because the lens hood does give a tad bit of protection around the lens and it shadows the lens just a bit. Uh, for video, I don't even consider lens flaring a problem. I actually consider it a creative element. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. It's nothing that can deter from any of your footage. If you have a problem taking photos with it, that could be another story. The takeaway is that it didn't distract me at all in five years or four years of shooting with this lens. I didn't get any images that were ruined because of it. So all in all, it handles lens flare quite well. There we go. 
Oh, one quick, one quick pointer. I wouldn't recommend pointing your mirrorless camera directly into the sun, especially if you're using a telephoto lens, such as like an 18150 or a 7200. Uh, some mirrorless cameras can actually have their sensors burned, their, their image sensors burned by the actual uh, intensity of the sun magnified <clears throat> through the telephoto lens. So I wouldn't recommend doing that. Just a small pointer. Moving into image quality, the star of the show, guys. Uh, image quality. So, I can say that from f4, wide open onwards, till about f11, f12, the optics are stellar. For a lens of this price point at $539, it fares exactly as well with the competition. The Fujinon lenses, the Olympus lenses, the Sony lenses, even Canon's other uh, ultra-wide angle lenses in the EFS mount do not beat uh, this lens. Actually, I would say this lens comes out on top in many situations. The same story goes in the corners where there's not much softness at all. It's actually incredible for a lens of this price point, this small, that the corners are able to be that sharp. Uh, Canon knows how to make good glass, put it that way. So all in all, this lens competes incredibly with any of the competition. I wouldn't recommend buying this lens for even for serious landscape work. And you're gonna see with some of the photos I show you after, I have some JPEG photos directly out of camera untouched. And then I have a series of photos that I've taken over the years with a more creative approach in post-processing to show you just what the lens is capable of. It's really astounding. It's impressive all over from center to corners at all apertures and at all focal lengths with 11 millimeters being the strongest point, 22 being the weakest point. Let's take a look actually on screen and uh, let's take a look on a basic wall. Here we go on a basic brick wall and go over this together to show you guys the image sharpness. We'll take this basic brick wall that we had before. So now you can see we're at F4 and 11 millimeters. Let's open up the image and let's zoom in. So this is the center of the frame, F4, 11 millimeters. This is wide open guys, don't forget, 11 millimeters. Okay, let's go down to the corner. We are wide open at 11 millimeters. Still excellent performance, nothing, nothing. I wouldn't even say this is soft, this is completely usable. Let's head to the next image. The next image brings us down to F5.6 at 11 millimeters. Let's hop into the center of the frame. Center of the frame, razor sharp, pin sharp guys. Look at this. This is a zoom lens at $540, it's pin sharp. Let's go into the corners. Corners, you're even actually a bit sharper at 5.6. They cleared up just a little bit. I wouldn't say this is as sharp as the center, but this for an ultra wide angle is very impressive at this price point. Let's zoom out. Now let's head down to F8. Open up at F8 in the center. Once again, razor sharp in the center at F8. This is about, I think, 200% zoom. Yeah, 100%, sorry. Let's go down to the corners. The corners at F8 cleared up very nicely. They're even sharper than 5.6. I would say edge to edge at F8, uh, this lens performs stellar. Don't worry about the shading, that's just my fireplace. I actually use the brick wall in my house to do this. Let's zoom out. Let's head to the next image. We're now at F11. Let's go to the frame, zoom in, center of the frame, F11. Here we go. Razor sharp once again. Sharp, sharp, sharp. Corner, razor sharp. This is an incredible landscape and uh, landscape lens, guys. There's nothing to say about it. F11. This is kind of the limit for me. As we move on now to, uh, let's say, F16 and even more F22, we get a little bit of diffraction kicking in, so we lose a bit of sharpness in the center. This is at F22. So still passable, but obviously not as sharp as the other apertures. And in the corner, we get a little bit more diffraction and the image does get a tad bit softer over here in the corner. Let's move up now to our um, 22 millimeter shots. This is at the end of the extremity. So if we look at this lens, we have the 11 obviously over here, 11 millimeters. And now we're moving up to the 22 millimeter mark on the lens. So 22 or 35 millimeters in full frame. So at 22 millimeters in the center of the frame, we're at f5.6, wide open. Here's the sharpness. Look at that, stellar. Middle of the frame, stellar sharpness. Go to the corners, 22 at f5.6. Not too bad, not as sharp as the center, still very passable. Let's move on to the next image. We're now at f8. Let's head up to the center, f8. Incredible sharpness at F8. Here we are in the center at 22 millimeters, F8, ISO 100. We're even able to see a, a strand of my cat's hair probably stuck to the wall. That's unbelievable. Head down to the center, uh, sorry, the corner. 
Still incredibly sharp. Don't forget guys, we're at 100% zoom here. This is such a rare case that we're zooming into 100%. So even if we're planning on printing images with this lens, even at 24 megapixels, it's unbelievable. Let's head down to the next image. We're now at F11. F11, center of the frame, razor sharp. And let's head down to the corner. Excellent image, excellent rendition, excellent micro contrast, nothing to say. Let's head down to F22. In the center, it gets a bit worse. And then we go down to F32, which is the uh, smallest aperture available. And you can see at F32, there's a noticeable drop in clarity. It's very, very soft. I wouldn't be using this lens at F22 for any situation. Uh, I just wouldn't, it's just not sharp enough. The amount of distraction is horrifying and it's really deterring from the image uh, completely. As you can see by the photographs on the screen, the lens is absolutely astounding. All the images that are rolling on the screen right now are actually JPEG images. And these are images that I took directly out of camera. Uh, there was nothing applied to them other than plus one sharpening on a standard Canon profile. And like I said, the, the micro contrast that comes out of the lens is really incredible. Um, you know, th there's not much editing that needs to be done. These were taken mostly on a Canon M5 with a couple taken on a Canon M6 as well. So, you know, pictures speak for themselves, even without editing, they're absolutely astounding. Canon just knows how to make good glass. And like I said about the EFM 32 six months ago, the lens is a bargain at this price for the image quality that it provides. Moving on to the um, more creative images. These are some of the images I've taken with this lens over the past four years in my own uh, shooting conditions with my own presets applied my own color grading, and basically my own vision for what I wanted these images to look like. They're obviously post-processed. They were shot in RAW, um, and most of these images were shot on a Canon M5, with only a few shot on the Canon N6. You can see from right at the center, these are actually cropped images, by the way, and they were put into this video at around two or 300 kilobytes per image. So they were shrunk by about 90%, because I hadn't saved them in my computer at full resolution and they still look phenomenal on screen. That just gives you an idea of the amount of contrast and sharpness that, that this lens would give you. It's really astounding. It's really incredible for a small piece of glass to 220 grams uh, and $550 that it performs this admirably. I'm very impressed by it. It has very little shortcomings. With that said, let's move into alternatives. What about other glass that we can buy? Well, we do have some other lenses uh, available. Um, there's certainly some other lenses that could be considered uh, in this segment. The only lens that'll be cheaper than the 11-22 will be Canon's own EFS. I believe it's the 1018. That also requires an adapter, which I don't have on hand. It's actually in my bag. So the lens will be mass, obviously a little bit larger, heavier, and it's no longer native. So you have to keep that adapter on. Uh, Canon sells that adapter, the um, EF to EFM mount for 200 whopping dollars. That's crazy. I still believe it's a great investment for any uh, M user because if you want to build your glass later on, you want to buy some more EFS lenses, if you want to stick to some crop sensors, or if you want to buy more EF glass, such as full frame lenses to expand your arsenal, then it's a win-win situation because you're buying those full frame lenses anyway. One would also say that that kind of defeats the purpose of using an M camera, and I tend to agree. The only full frame lens that I use with my camera is a 7200 F4 IS Mark II version, the small 7200, and sometimes the 18150. Another thing to take note of is now that the R series have come out a little over a year and a half ago, the Canon EOS R, the R5, and the R6, unfortunately that mount will not work with any of the RF lenses that Canon have been releasing. One great thing about this is that Canon has the most versatile and complete line of lenses available from any manufacturer. So even if you chose not to upgrade to a Canon R body or RF lens, you'd be hard pressed to find any issue with the uh, over 100, I think it's 130 or 140 lenses that they make between EFS and EF. So you'd be covered either way. Getting back on topic, the following. We first look at the Canon 1018. Uh, it's the least expensive option, uh, but I believe the 1122 is sharper across the frame, has less flare. Um, the 1018 has obviously more chromatic aberration, more vignetting and distortion, and they both feature image stabilization. The next lens that you could buy would be the Canon EFS 1022. It has a wider range. It goes to 10 millimeters instead of 11. It has a faster aperture. Um, it's more expensive all, and it's obviously not as sharp as the 1122. 
I believe it comes in at just around $650. Another option, which is the only weather sealed lens of the bunch, would be the, the amazing Tamron 1024. Also more expensive than the 1122, but it does go down to 10 millimeters and up to 24 millimeters. It does have built in image stabilization and it has weather resistance, which is the only lens in this arsenal other than the um, 1122 that has that. So it's another great option. And finally, the Sigma uh, 1020 is also a wonderful lens with a constant 3.5 aperture. It's wonderful. It delivers a slightly wider angle. It offers a constant aperture and it's fairly fast, like I said, at 3.5. Once again, these lenses all require adapters to work. Moving on, we have the Tokina 11 to 20, which was a lens that I used to use back when I started with Canon. It offers a fast 2.8 aperture. So good for astrophotography, good for stopping action. It's a wonderful lens. I would say it's just as sharp as the 1122 in my books, corner to corner, but it is much larger. It doesn't have image stabilization. Um, and obviously it's increasing of size and weight. And finally, I'm going to mention a lens that isn't a zoom lens, but it is uh, another lens that I love that I have in my arsenal. It's the Rockinen uh, 12 millimeter F2 for the EFM mount, meaning that this lens doesn't need an adapter. Uh, it's a manual focus lens made by Samyang Rockinen. Works for the EFM mount on your camera, so it would basically go right into your camera without any adapter uh, needed at all. And it offers a fast, constant F2 aperture with a click aperture wheel manual focus. I use this lens for astrophotography and it's the only other lens that I would personally buy other than the 1122. At 12 millimeters, it offers, it offers a 20 millimeter full frame focal length, but the F2 aperture is about two stops faster than the 1122. That's massive. Uh, the 1122 cannot be used for astrophotography. The wonderful Rockin in 12 F2 can, but obviously it does have its shortcomings. It's a third party lens. We don't know how the lens will withstand abuse over time. It's manual focus. Uh, and obviously it doesn't have any EXF data. So when you take the picture or shot, when you get into Lightroom, you don't have any data associated to your photo, such as focal length, aperture, or ISO. But at the price, I think uh, you could find these on special for about $200 when they go on Black Friday. At that price, it's actually a steal. So another great lens. And finally, to conclude, uh, what do I think about the 1122? Well, I think it's absolutely phenomenal, guys. It's a native mount. It keeps things feeling very compact. It has superb optics at a very low price. Uh, it controls flare pretty well. It's small and light at 220 grams. It's cheaper than all the competition other than Canon's own 1018. Uh, it has very quick autofocus for the STM motor with no noise for video focusing. It has an extremely close focusing distance of 0.15 meters, giving you a 0.30x macro. That's incredible. It has almost zero chromatic aberration, meaning longitudinal chromatic aberration is non-existent. That's incredible. Like I said, it favors well against the competition. What kind of cons could I see for the 1122? Well, first and foremost, it doesn't come with a lens hood. Canon, I don't know what you're doing. Why don't you give a 10 cent lens hood? Anyhow, it doesn't come with a lens hood. There is no weather sealing. That's a problem for me. Uh, I find that it does have significant barrel distortion at 11 millimeters that needs to be corrected in post. It bothers me. Uh, the fact that the lines converge outwards at 11, it's very hard to control despite how you hold your camera. Even if you're at equilibrium level, you're still going to get that barrel distortion. That's bothersome. Obviously, it can only be used on Canon M bodies. So if you leave your, the Canon M system, unfortunately, uh, you're out of luck. You're not going to be able to use this lens uh, with anything else other than a Canon M body. Um, it's not suitable for astrophotography. I know that doesn't maybe strike a con for some people, but it's not. You cannot really use this lens with astrophotography. It's just too slow. And at f4, you're going to be cranking the ISO um, much higher, which leaves us to the Rockin in f2. And that, that's sort of like a direct competitor for this lens in that retrospect. Um, and obviously the 18 millimeter full flame equivalent, meaning 11 millimeters equals 18 millimeters is not as wide as the competition. The Fujinon offers 10 millimeters. Canon's other lenses offer 10 millimeters. Uh, the Sony offers 10 millimeters. And you know, 16 millimeters to 18 millimeter, once again, is a very big difference when it comes to full frame glass. It can be seen massively in photos. So for me, uh, that's also another con. And I don't like the fact that this is a variable aperture lens. The fact that it changes from four to 5.6 quite rapidly. 
Unfortunately, I don't like that, and I don't like the locking mechanism on the side of the lens. Well, guys, if you've stuck around for this long, thank you so much. I know it was a very long review, but I wanted to cover all bases and make sure I gave you my full and thoughtful observations over the last four years of using this lens. If you found this review helpful, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. If you have any questions, leave them down below in the comments or simply send me an email. I answer all of my comments. With that being said, I hope everybody has a great day. Don't forget people, stay visual and I will see you in the next video. Take care now.